Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to a project generation. I'm here with, uh, I think outspoken is fair to say. No, I, I, you know, principled we'd call it. Um, here with uh, with Ralph Assel. Thank you very much for joining us. So Ralph, tell me about your background. How did you come to Stanmore? The accent doesn't sound like a, you know, born and bred Stanmore person. Yeah, I don't want to talk to you. You've just insulted me. <laughs> 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 no, my background, um, I, well, I was born in Morocco and um, I decided because of events that took place in Morocco in 1956, it was getting a bit difficult, I decided to um, explore the world and uh, I had the permission and the blessing of my parents, so I left on my own. I didn't have very much money on me, and I decided to go to Israel. The Aliyah from Morocco was a bit difficult to Israel. And I said, well, I'd like to go to England. Mm. The reason for that is my grandfather was born in England, and I wanted to know where he was born and his history. So I came to England um, via Gibraltar, mm. got on the boat, can I just interject? So you went from Morocco to Israel, then Israel straight no, no, to England? No, I'm sorry. I was I wanted to go to Israel. Oh, I see. Sorry, got it. And okay. then I, I, I had difficulties getting got to it. Israel with the Jewish agency. I understand. And I said, well, I'll go to Israel via England. And I wanted to go to England to uh, find out about my grandfather who was born here in London, in Whitechapel. Yeah. So I traveled from Casablanca, where I was born. And... Um, I went to Gibraltar to catch a boat that was coming from Australia on the way to England. Um, I got on that boat. I, it didn't cost me a penny. I managed to get on it. Security in those days, I know what it is today. <laughs> and uh, I had a very good time on the boat because I was with a lot of Australian Meshuganers who, 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 who came to England for fun and I joined them. So I arrived in England after four days I think it took and wow. when I arrived I say all right I'm here what do I do now <laughs> I was 17 years old by the way wow and the, the amount of money was that I had in my pocket was about 15 pounds sterling which maybe in 1956 was whatever it was anyway I went to Whitechapel where my grandfather was born I got a taxi ride from from the docks Again, it was free. Um, I don't remember why I didn't pay. I don't know. And I got to Stafford Hill uh, because I asked where the, was the Jewish quarters were. They did send me to Golders Green or Hendon. I must have looked at myself, at me, and they decided Stafford Hill was what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Stafford Hill and um, I, might, I stayed in a small hotel. And after two days, I found uh, digs and I stayed with a family called Abrahams. They were Russian refugees. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak a word of English. The English was non-existent. Yeah. So we got on very well. <laughs> Did your parents know where you were meanwhile? Did you? Yes, indeed. Uh, communication was very hard in those days. I mean, you had to book a call and reverse charges and all that. Mm -hmm. they, it used to take about two or three hours before you went through. Wow. So I, I, um, I was told that uh, with my mother tongue, with, which is French, I could, I could apply for a job in a French bank. Hmm. So I went to the French embassy and they recommended me to a French bank called Bank of Indochina. And I, I arrived in, in England on day number one and on, on day five, I was working. Is it serious? So you're working for a bank. They didn't ask for any qualifications. No, nothing. no, because in those days, you had to have a working permit to work. Mm -hmm. They were looking for staff, but I had a British passport. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to go through the um, normal, the, the formalities of applying for a working permit. So I got, I was all right. My qualification I had, I had what you, you call a baccalaureate at the time, which is like GCSE or something. Right. 
and then they uh, they needed a clerk, which uh, I managed to get the job, but it takes more than 10 minutes to tell you how I got the job. I got an interview and the manager of that, of that branch, which was an important branch, it's called the Bank of Indochina. You wouldn't believe it when he interviewed me. He says, what's your name, where you come from? And he said, you come from Casablanca and your name is Asso? I said, yes. He said, do you know Mr. Mesod Asso? I said, he's my father. <laughs> So you you can't believe that, can you, or, or not? Go on, I mean, well, what's gone? Well, I mean, you come from Casablanca, you don't know anybody, you have no recommendation, you apply for the first job, you go to a bank, and you meet the manager who knew my father. <laughs> so you pick up the phone, phone, and he said to my father, I've got your son here. And he's quite <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it incredible? I say, yeah. Th those, so that those, was my first experience. Those who know um, you, Ralph, aren't surprised. You should know. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked in the uh, department called arbitrage, and I had the time of my life because I had a few pounds. The rent in those days were uh, practically not very much, and and I had uh, my, my salary was six pounds a week, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I managed to to get on. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So then, I can carry on, but uh, so then you stayed. Uh, clearly, you stayed, or you went back to Morocco at some point. No, I stayed in England. There was no question of me going back to Morocco. My aim was to go to Israel. Mm -hmm. So I went to see the Jewish agency, and I don't want to bore you. I mean, there were Moroccans and Moroccans, Europeans, Moroccans, non-European Moroccans. And this chap couldn't make the difference. And uh, I didn't get on. And I said, well, forget it for the time being. I'll come back in a year or two. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in England. Um, what happened after a year, I repeat, I, I had a British passport. Mm. I got called up in the army. Oh, wow. I said, my goodness, what do I do now? <laughs> I, I looked at the situation and I said, two years, I'm 18, I have an adventure. So I, I didn't run away. I was called up. I passed my medical. And before I knew I was, I was a soldier in a British army. Wow, gosh. The, the prob problem with that is that I didn't speak, speak a word of English. All the time I was with French people. So I arrived in the British Army, not knowing my left from my right. And when I say I didn't know my left from my right, when they used to say, turn left, I used to turn right or left. <laughs> or, or <not. laughs> and I was, I was one, one minute behind everybody else. But, uh, <laughs> and, but at the time of my life, I enjoyed myself. And after a few weeks of uh, hard, um, what do you call it, uh, square bashing, mm -hmm. I decided to make the best of, uh, of the army. And uh, I played basketball at the time. And <laughs> basketball was not known in England, but they were starting. So they didn't know what to do with me. And they found the right, I said, become a physical training instructor. Fine. So I, I spent my time teaching basketball. Hmm. Then I learned how to drive free of charge. So I learned how to drive. And I started giving courses in French to, to uh, uh, various soldiers and uh, VIPs. So I had a good time in the army. I didn't hmm. regret one single bit. I traveled as well because at the time it was Aden, there was uh, problems in Aden. And um, because I learned to drive and I was a driver, I used to drive all around picking up soldiers and taking them to barracks mm. in order shot wow. uh, to put them on the plane to, to, to go to, uh, to various places in the Middle East. Wow. Yeah. That's that quite interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, just fast forward a few years, I guess you either feel free to tell us anything else subsequently, but I know you're also involved at the moment in, in Harif, am I right? Right now we are, yes. yes. And we've got good news at Harif. Uh, this weekend, just gone rather, 
um, we applied to go to the board of deputies mm -hmm. as Harif and we were accepted. Oh, well done, Mansell. Do you want, do you want to just tell everyone, uh, firstly, feel free to fill in, you know, I've obviously missed out a large chunk of your life, but feel free to just tell people what Harif is if they don't know. No, Harif is an organization set up by a lady called Lynn Julius. She gives um, conferences right, left and center right now on Zoom practically every week. Harif is an organization that was set up to promote the um, issues that we had as Jews living in, in, in Arab countries. Mm -hmm. 850,000 Jews lived in Iraq, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Libya, Lebanon, Egypt, certainly. And um, we were expelled. Um, in Iraq, they had a tough time with what they called the Farhud, where uh, there were 140,000 Jews living in Iraq, and a lot of them were murdered. In Morocco, we were 250,000. Uh, we now have 2,000 people in Morocco living there. So we promote the idea that we lived, there was a Jewish population in these Arab countries, and um, we tell them that we were expelled, we tell them how we lived, and there's more and more interest now about Jews from Arab countries. Mm. Every, every time on Zoom, you get someone who talks about Morocco, about Iraq, about Lebanon, and it, it, it's very exciting. But I'd like to make a point. When people say, oh, terrible, you were expelled. And I said, well, I'm delighted we were, because when you look at Israel today, the Sephardi population is 50% of the population of Israel. Mm. And if it wasn't for the Arabs kicking us out, the, the population of Israel wouldn't be that much. So the Sephardi and Mizrahi population of the Arab countries contributed quite a lot to Israel development, um, if, you, if you agree with that. Interesting, no, they're really interesting. Um... You don't have to keep on saying interesting. Well, well, I'm an interesting you person. <laughs> well, you know, we're English here. Um, have you been back to Morocco? Uh, I've been back a few times. Morocco at the moment has a king who is so pro-Jewish, it's almost embarrassing. <laughs> All the are being renovated. Uh, it's the, the idea of joining with Israel has been for a long time exchanges we got of, of a, a lot of Israeli uh, Moroccans who come to Israel because they like to go to uh, pray uh, on their parents tomb and on various uh, Chachamim that were well respected mm -hmm. so we have a good ties at the moment with uh, Morocco I just asked from Morocco to England, what did you think when you came to the Jewish community in England? There must have been a massive change from Morocco, no? Not only that, I'm sorry to say, I had a lot of problem with the Ashkenazi Jews because the momentum there at the time were that the, you may or may not know, the Sephardi for Morocco and Arab countries in Israel had a lot of conflict. They didn't get on with the Ashkenazi, yeah. as you know. Yeah, for sure. And that was transmitted. It's a very, uh, very sad part of our history, by the way, for those, yeah, who, those who don't know. The, the, the way that this, the Mabarot camps and everything was horrible. Yeah, what the, yeah. the Taimani, the Yemenite Jews, was disgraceful. Yeah. So I, I don't want to, to sound too, um, what do you call it, snobbish, but the Jews that from Morocco that went to, to, to Israel were very religious and uneducated. So they they had a conflict with the, the European Jews, but now thank goodness it's leveled. So that that idea and behavior was transmitted here in Europe. So the Ashkenazi Jews, when I first came and I went to synagogues and all that, I wasn't well received. But thank goodness there was a Sephardi synagogue in Maidavel and in Bevismarck. And uh, because I was, I was quite frum at the time and I was a bit lost not to be able to carry my 
religion forward. So, but um, the Sephardis in this country um, helped me quite a lot to settle. Wow. Wow. I'm not going to say interesting because you're going to shout at me again. <laughs> I was only joking, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I guess let's let's we've only got probably a couple of minutes left. Um, Is that all? Okay. I know we have to have a part two and three and four. Uh, I I just want to ask if there is a a message or something, you know, what do you think the younger generation, you know, I know, thank God you come often, you know, well, in in, in times that were less Corona-esque, there'd be you, there'd be your son, your grandchildren, Friday night in shul. Um, What do you think is lost a little bit on the younger generation? It's uh, two years of their life. I said two years could be three years or one year or six months. We don't know, but now they've found the vaccine, thank goodness. But I feel for them because the age, when I look at my grandchildren, 17, 18, 21, it's the time where they enjoy themselves. You go out uh, playing football, you can't. You go to uh, nightclubs, not nightclubs, discos or whatever you call them today, and you can't. People, uh, youngsters who are at university are locked in, so they're missing two years of their life. Can I just expand, they... expand it. Not only I don't mean just lost Corona-wise, and I, I threw that into the into the question. I'm, and just in general, what do you think? You know, having grown up in a certain age or generation, what what do you think are our current generation, the youth, the teenagers, etc.? What do you think? Maybe they may be missing. They don't realize some, a message you'd give to them. First of all, they're not missing anything, apart from the corona place. They have a very good time. We live in a very affluent society, which when I was a youngster was non-existent. Mm -hmm. Today they can travel, they can see the world, they can study, they can go to yeshivas if they want to, they can go here and everywhere. They're having a good time, it's a good life for a youngster. And I don't think young people uh, in general are missing anything in life. If they're missing anything in life, is because they, they, it's their fault. They're not going out. They're not trying very hard. But otherwise, what, what do you have today? Very, very little to, uh, that they can complain about. That's my view. Mm-hmm. Do you think they're happier today than they were, given that they've got so much kind of going for them? There should be. Whether they are or not, it's something else. But there should be. What is there missing for them? Oh, if you want to study, you can. If you want to go to university, you can. In my days, to go to university wasn't very easy. You had no help whatsoever. Today, you can. And you, you have access to the internet, which we didn't have, so you know what the world is all about. You can go out. I mean, the youngsters <coughs> today have a very good time. Very good time. Amazing. Okay, there you yeah. are. But I now realize that um, I, don't have, I don't have the world resting on my shoulders myself, you know, and I'm more relaxed. And the youngsters should, should do the same. I mean, we, we have very little to worry about. We are concerned mainly about Israel, which is a priority. But now Israel is a, is a country with, which can stay on their own two feet, very strong. Economically, it's a 17 country in the world. It has a strong army. The people are happy in the main. There's poor people like in any, in any other countries. And consequently, we, we as Jews should be very happy where we stand today. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to ask one last question. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, I want a proudest moment since you set foot in the UK. Uh, to have to have got married and got children that's really that's i know it's a normal answer but really because when you come from the diaspora kind of of thing and you're by yourself to 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 then create a family from nothing to create to 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 meet the the, the woman of your life and then to have children who baruch hashem have done quite well so far <laughs> no, I'm just saying. You know, I, I, firstly, thank you for your time, Ralph. But we really get a sense of you know, appreciating the struggles of, of you know people. As you said, people don't know what it means to kind of leave your family at 17, travel yeah. to a country. It's also interesting to see what we would call the hashkacha along the way. Yeah. How you found your place, your job, your wife, family, and and you know, thank God everyone is is 
settled here. Yeah, thank yeah. God. It's beautiful. And I, I did. I did very well. I worked for a top company. I traveled the world with the company that employed me. Um, I, I, I succeeded commercially, or whatever you want to call it. In my own way, I'm not a tycoon, as you can see. <laughs> that, that's why I've, I've got, I can't afford a frame at the back of my. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not complaining. You know, you can complain. I'm sure. I'm sure I could find some reason for being unhappy, but I'm not. Um, my attitude to life was: when you get up in the morning, you said goodness, thank you, God, and you'll be happy, and that's it. Finish, full stop. If you have good health, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have to title the interview Smiling Through Life with Ralph Astor. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. And Thank uh, you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. I've learned something yesterday. I'm upset nobody knew about it. Your son was Bar Mitzvah recently. Uh, he, he, yeah, he, yes. They grow up. It's, it's, it's unbelievable how quickly they grow up. Yeah, I ask him, I say, what about 